Um, I'm James Holden, this is my studio, and we're just going to go through um, some of how I work and uh, go through a few of the, the tracks of my new album CD called The Idiots Are Winning, and um, just talk about how it, how it works and my method of making organic electronic stuff. <laughs> so. Well, this is this is Buzz, which is, is the the first proper sequence where I started using, and still my favourite of all, all music creation stuff. Um, I started using it because it was free, and uh, it still is free on BuzzMachines.com. It's the, the website for it, and uh, and because you could do everything in the computer. Um, so here is the downside of it is that it, it's not so reliable and I couldn't get it to load anything that actually made it onto the album so this is one of the, the tracks that didn't make the cut um, but it's actually loaded without crashing so that's, that's the bonus <laughs> um, there's, there's a, a bunch of pages to it so there's the, this is a modular like just the blue ones are synths and drum machines and stuff and the pink would you call that pink? puce pink yeah it's kind of that colour is FX, VSTs, DirectX, and then Buzz has a bunch of its own native plugins, which are the more exciting ones because they don't always work properly. <laughs> Makes it, you know, more more amusing. So um, I started playing just quietly. <laughs> he says <laughs> it crashes. No, it should start. And this is, see, this is the the arrangement page. You might know, zoom in, and, uh, and it's kind of, I mean, it's not as friendly as Cubase, but it's free, so that's why I chose it. And, but you get used to it. And working this great arrangement is the hard to learn, but then gives you a lot of power over really controlling and layering up. You can be and record one layer of tweaking the delays, and then go back, press record again, go back and tweak another parameter, and you can just layer them up. You know, and then you can go back and edit that in a quicker way than Cubase, even, it's, even though it looks rubbish. And, uh, here's, this, is the, uh, this is where I write most of the melodies on the EP, and this, um, again, is like a, a grid, old school with tracker interface. And, um, but you write using, you know, you put notes in using the PC keyboard, Z is C, X is D. Sharp and stuff, and because it works. I mean, it works because if you learn to play keyboard or guitar, you know where every note is, and you start to play cliches. Whereas if you're playing, you just hit B, and it sounds good, and that's you know it doesn't, More doesn't yeah, it yeah. breaks breaks apart like stuff you already learn. And what's good about Buzz is this modular, again, this modular arrangement of synths and stuff. I mean, you could do it in this proper studio if you had. 20, 30 grand. Or, I mean, if this was all hardware, this would be, you know, just buying it would cost more money than I have. And, but you get the flexibility of being able to wire anything into anything else. So the chains of effects that you put on a sound aren't as linear as a sort of Cubase channel strip or anything like that. And then, which in itself opens up interesting possibilities. But then, Buzz also has a lot of these these ones that aren't connected, the sort of modulation plugins. So an LFO can be working on two different parameters, and then one of these knobs will be controlling the effect of that. And this, you know, I haven't got this controller hooked into Buzz properly at the moment, but when it was working, I'd be playing the filter on the bass. As that comes up, it would trigger something, the drums would go a bit bananas over the top of it. So it turns buzz turns from being a straight sequencer that predictably plays the music into like almost like you know like an unpredictable yeah. instrument like an old analog synth or something something with its own character which comes out and, and <laughs> like everything every single part of the album was something where I'd almost every part anyway it was something where I'd make it in buzz come up with the melodies and stuff set it as a loop or a Sort of pattern and just play the filters and effects live and the synths, control the synths live and just leave it recording 10 channels into Cubase or whatever. And once you've got half an hour of bad stone tweaking, you can squash that down to a, a good song, hopefully. <laughs> I 
I mean, my working method is just to stay up very late, and by the morning you might not remember what you did last night, so it takes a bit of decoding. But going back, we've got his, the bass has been played by the Dakota plugin, um, and it goes through, I don't know what that is, but it, you can see the signal gets split off two ways, so it's going through some sort of sample chopping plugins over here, and then all kinds of stuff, but the main signal path goes through this, uh, it's another, just a buzz native plugin that's a, a cross between a reverb, a delay, a sort of, and a, a buffer trigger, sort of effect all in one. Um, and then, see, go away. Um, but you can see here the sliders are jumping around because I, this is something that I've recorded live. I think the top one I recorded live. And then you can see the, the bottom one, which is just wiggling around at its own chord. That was something that's it's an LFO that's hooked to something else. And, and then the, you can see a bit more of the signal. <laughs> Sorry. Blockfish is it's another another free one that's amazing. It's a really just a nice compressor that mm. has a character. It's not like a doesn't do every compression job, but it, it fits in certain places. It's really it's a nice little. But I mean, almost half the machines on the screen tend to be compressors. It's a lot of my working method is to have too many compressors and on the master and my favourite trick is to throw like a really loud kick drum that just kicks all the compressors out and Push pops the back in. Yeah, that kind of, you know, the, the things that sound engineers don't really approve of so much are the things where you start making, because it's digital now, you don't have to worry about tape or anything, so you, can, you, know, you don't even have to worry about people's ears too much because that's the fun of it. <laughs> Yeah, on, on flute and uh, cordro on the on the album, lots of the sounds were just me playing this live with a click track and the headphones through the through this gorilla amp. And, uh, and yeah, I mean it's it's all crappy stuff, but it, once it's been back in the computer and just pumped up a little bit, it, uh, it, it sounds good enough, you know, on, on a big system. And this. This one I didn't bend, it's my brother and sister got it for me for Christmas a little while ago, which was cool of them. <laughs> but um, it's an FM synth, and in between the, the like programming part and the FM synth part, these switches just turn off bits of the data bus, so you get corrupted sounds. And that, this should be a harpsichord 3, but evidently isn't. <laughs> um, if I try and get it And most of the time you spend turning it off and on again. <laughs> Much like Windows, but... And it's, you can play it for 10 minutes and get no good sounds at all, which is probably what's going to happen now the camera's running. But um, you can also play for 10 seconds and come up with the best sound. Generates, here it's generated a little file where the C is playing, it's playing the E, isn't it, up above. So it's, but it's, this particular one seems to be quite harmonic about the wrong notes it generates. So you can hear, like on that flute track on the album, you can hear I'm playing and just flipping these at random really and sort of cutting around and, and it comes up with nice notes of its own accord that sort of fit in, in key with the music and then by the time you take them, with Cubase's pitch shift is amazing, mm. so I'll take lots of little notes and change the wrong ones to be what I want them to be and stuff like that. So. And my brother on Christmas Day got a, a white noise feedback wall of 
wall of sand that I can't recreate. <laughs> so, if, uh, if he's watching this, he can send me the answer. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> This idea of it being really the opposite of a nice VSTI that behaves well, and it was, I'm lucky to get the sound I got out of it because I'm never going to get that sound again. And it's something, it's like a, when you hear a great <coughs> musician playing, that performance is special as well. This isn't a great musician, but it, it still means something. <laughs> That's the most fun you can have with it. This one because it's uh, it's not FM, it's uh, like a sample pack based one. So the bends all end up with these weird, more interesting in terms of playing it live because it ends up with these weird sort of you know distortion, compression, flangey sort of retriggery sort of sounds in there. Um, I've killed it. Come back to me. <laughs> You spend quite a lot of your time checking all the switches are in the off position. And, uh... And it... Kind of when you hear a lot of circuit bend, when you hear music from a bending scene on the, the internet, there is a bit of a tendency that you can get lost in how much fun you have in making a row and oh, made a good noise and it's it's kind of the same as when you first get Ableton or Reason and you make a really cheesy dance track and oh, computer's making dance music and it's exciting but you can, it's a case of like, of catching the good bits and, and finding them and trying to get them. With this one they're a bit more recreatable so you can actually, the next thing we're doing is going to stick a MIDI sockets into the bend box to automate all the bends because then you it can be, I had a little session of like tapping this button and playing bends live over the top of the beats, but it'd be nice to be able to repeat that. Um, I don't know what it's. Jake Fairley from Border Community sent me this one and found it in the shop in Canada for cheap. It's like, I've got one, you can have this right. one. So we're gonna, this is the next one. I'm gonna take the part and I'm gonna try and uh, get something out of. This is uh, off the album, this is Lump. It was the first track off the album by Black and Cures. And, um, hard to pick up what's interesting, <laughs> actually. Then the, the most interesting thing is that every single web file in the whole thing is called Buzz Bounce and then a number, because everything is like Buzz Bounce 10 and then that's an hour long file that's got edited down. And yeah, and basically, Buzz is where I make music and Cubase is where I get RSI and Carpal Tunnel, <laughs> just moving things. But I guess like a really key part of my technique in it is what Cubase lets you do is um, where you can take a, a bit of audio and uh, and slice it and then process just that slice with uh, with any of your, your VST plugins if it all works. Yeah. So this this process of always sort of slicing, affecting and moving on, it's like the other the other side to the plank live. Everything's live and then at 3am when 
you're just so out of it that you may as it may as well be live even though you're kind of clicking away because you're still lost in the moment mm. and still really sort of trying to work out how to make it good without polishing it in a, in a normal way or something and um, it just becomes this process of throwing you know, slice, reverb, slice, reverse, reverbs, reverb, delay, spectral plug in, oh that's okay and then, and then you end up with a big mess of WAV files that again get squashed down and, and then the, the bulk of it is just just the edit of making a good arrangement out of it which this I don't know if I managed or not I Always, I think, like it could be better, but yeah. this one I got to five minutes and I stopped, so it's good. I tend to, yeah, it's hard. I Where it was kind of getting you going with it. Yeah, I think that's because <coughs> I end up out of buzz with lots of long files of parts, and it's useful because buzz's tempo isn't exactly the same as Cubase's right. version of the same tempo, so it's useful to get the drums in just to get the timing right on yeah. everything. But then, I mean, arrangement more and more, especially recently, and finally I'm happy with my tracks because I've got away from some of the dance music sort of arrangement traditions. And so you don't, I think this, this idea of putting an intro for DJs is, is so stupid because if they're a good DJ, they don't need the intro because they can do something musical with they it. They can work with it Yeah, and why, I mean, I don't want rubbish DJs playing my songs. <laughs> So you, you get away from that and just start to, I, I read the, the Brian Eno, his diaries a year of appendices and it's that's such a good, gives you such an insight into how he approaches the music and how you just got to step out of it and see what's exciting about it and what's the structure, where's the backbone of the track and for example with this one it was just all about the bass line which is just sort of played live, pulling in bending noise and it's I was trying to load it up before and I have no idea how that happened. <laughs> but it's so the bass line runs through the whole the whole track and it's and it's basically the buzz played live tweaks that runs you know, was longer and I've just squashed it to make it punk, keep the arrangements sort of interesting and snappy. And then everything else was you know, I was playing these drums and the fills and the solos, I was playing them live over the bass line and the headphones and and so they it kind of sits together naturally anyway, where it was rising, it still <laughs> just snaps into place and it's still rising. Yeah. So this is also because I work on my own, my own computer wasn't quite fast enough for my plug-in, so this is, this is like the, the third time it all got bounced down into channels, maybe, so, or maybe not a third of this stuff, but now the computer well, I haven't got it past 30% on the CPU meter, so I'm really pleased You're safe with that for a while stuff. then. Yeah. yeah, so, but, um, yeah, I think this is, you can hear, this is, this is it, it sort of. This is a bit where I've had to, I had squashed down a lot to make this drop into. sequence it's a very like it's called lump because it's like a lump sort of rhythm the whole thing it's very sort of bumpy I guess or, yeah. yeah so and then um, yeah this is just going back here this is the drums this all would have been played live and just pissing around delays on the hi-hats on the attack of the camera and then it's just in case of here I've had to slice and dice a few little different sections to make it make sense.
solo and the mute the wrong way around on this. <laughs> <laughs> on the, uh, on the, yeah, on the remote zero. Yeah. Remote. So it's really nice. Oh, hang on. Um, and this, yeah, that's, that's all there is to it. Just, I don't know, you can hear the, the backwards reverb, is that my favourite trick? <laughs> it always works. Sometimes it doesn't work. Is there anything, any kind of complex or quite complex edits in there anywhere? I think you've this kind one of... is more because more of it is in the live stuff. Yeah, because the... you run, yeah. yeah. Let's just throw it and see what looks. And I think maybe it's not so much about how complicated the edits are, but or how, yeah. that they make sense, that they're, they're elegant or, yeah, again, like lots of the minimal stuff is loads of mad edits and mm. crazy sounds, but they disrupt the rhythm or they don't really have a purpose in the song. It's, it's another popular thing at the moment, isn't yeah, it? The edit, it's kind of, real kind of... I remember when I first got Cubase, it was when I, the, this record break in the class I did, I just stayed up for like three or four days of just non-stop, just oh, I'll back as reverb that hi-hat and just going through the whole thing. It's this, because it seemed really exciting, but then I wouldn't want to go back and do that again because it doesn't, now mm. the sort of playing live thing yeah. just seems much more real or yeah. honest and, and when you're playing it live you, you know if you're feeling it or not whereas sort of edit, editing something making it then listening back it's a very you don't really see the music objectively it's a very yeah. it's also hard to be involved it's directly involved yeah. isn't it you, yeah. are, you have got that distance all the time yeah. you're not kind yeah. of lot. Yeah. yeah exactly and the singing thing is um, <laughs> It's uh, like a Microsoft thing. Nathan found it and showed it to me ages and ages ago. It's real. It's like Windows 98 sort of era of like Microsoft children's speaking thing. And if you put in like R's and whatever and set the singing preset, it does. It sings, but it sings the wrong notes for your song, obviously. And then just through, I can't remember if it was Cubase's pitch shift or. No, I tried Melodyne, but I couldn't get it to do what I wanted, <laughs> which is always the case, isn't it? But um, yeah, it's, I think it's Cubase's pitch shift, just sort of bending <laughs> things to make my own okay. melodies yeah. out of this yodeling computer. But again, this is a lot of played live. Oh no, this one isn't. Yeah, we've got real midi nights. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> How exciting is that? This one, um, oh, my favourite bit of this is just at the end. It's, um, because it's all um, just making midi parts and then copying it out of time with snap turned off and just dragging whole chunks of things. So you're playing double overlapping the same notes, just confusing the same mm. stuff. Again, it's just being stoned and finding a, a different sort of groove out of it, or you know, by the combination of things out of time can somehow.
plants aren't playing out of it, and I don't, I don't know why. <laughs> but um, this is like me playing this that electric guitar, which was free for secondhand records, and um, playing bass on that again through this amp. I think and it's just. I mean, if you put it put it through Max Bass and BBE, then it doesn't matter that it's an yeah. eight centimeter yeah. cone. So. <laughs> Yeah, I was excited, I was playing live, and I think it took me like, the actual wave of me playing the guitar was, you know, it was recorded at 4am and it's like an hour long and it's only got this tiny little section that's entire. <laughs> <laughs> so, it took about an hour to get to that yeah, point. Yeah, I was that's enjoying myself yeah. as well, there's all kinds of Brian May moments yeah. in there. <laughs> but I find Cubase's automation quite slow to like counterintuitive or just, mm. I mean it's very elegant and very neat but just to make a if I make it a track it always seems to be better to press record and do it live or to go back into bars mm. and do it that way yeah. it's just really just too much is the wrong side of your brain the wrong yeah and music yeah. isn't even even bark isn't about the accuracy really it is but it's the deviation from the accuracy that makes it mm. This one is it's the track Flute, which is, I think, the most live stuff of any of, any of the tracks on the album. Um, which it started out, I, I thought it would be a good idea, again late at night, to do edits on the Cubase metronome. I just recorded the metronome through my phone and put it back in the computer. And it was a bad idea, it was a real waste of hours. <laughs> but after I'd done the metronome and stuff, I started playing things over it and then the leftovers became this, yeah. Um, yeah, the interesting bit. It's just, yeah, like the most interesting bits of the album are the bits that almost you can't see why they're interesting mm. on the Cubase screen because they're these. The yeah, process they're, going, yeah. yeah. The, the play live, sort of. Sorry. So the, um, the drumming is me on the table and it with pens and stuff. That, that's this keyboard through that amp playing on the top. And you can hear these sort of. I don't know. Yeah. And the sort of clicks is just the click of the keys, I think, some of the sort of background sound. Yeah, and it's just, just bending for hours and hours and then piecing together the best you can see it's sliding right over. Slice quite a lot wherever it is. Yeah. So, yeah, this is every cut is probably the one good 10 second bit out of that three minutes of playing. And also, even though, like, all the time I was learning like classical instruments, I could never play in time ever, I could just never keep a tempo, and that's the curse of my existence now. <laughs> that that impression of sort of noise terror or something. 
But this one, it wasn't really planned to be an album, that's the thing. It was planned to be, I was going to do an EP. It was like a, you know, a double vinyl thing, I thought that would be nice. And then it just dragged on for ages and sort of started collecting too many tracks for it to really be an EP anymore. <laughs> and, but it isn't, I think it's been quite stress-free, the whole process, because I wasn't thinking of it as, oh, this is my first album, I'm going to make it perfect. Because that's, that's a whole stressful process I can look forward to in the future. And so this was just a case of, I'd sort of, up until pretty near the end of making it, I was thinking, oh, it's an EP, I've got all these tracks. and They do hang together, but it wasn't so intentional. It's just a, this is from Lump. It was the first one I finished, and it's like two years of me learning and getting a little bit better and exploring new ideas and, and sort of getting into this sort of looser style of making stuff more. And it just by the time like I loaded all the WAVs into Cubase just in a row and tried swapping them around, and it, it just sort of makes sense. Done. <laughs> it was really like really painless to sort of put it together. Yeah. Um, and then the mastering was. I mean, again, because I always use the same sort of process, it all sounds like it belongs together, mostly. I mean, mm. Lump's a lot more digital than Flute was, but they all end up sounding sort of like like me or something. So, just just a case of, like, I tend, because the tannoy's in the room, I tend to put a bit too much bass in everything. So, we, all, we get it mastered by this guy, Shane, that he thinks is just a nice guy with great ears and who understands what sort of sound the label's going for as well and everything, so it's just a case of going down there and mm -hmm. listening on some really nice speakers and getting it exactly right, but it's usually just like one dB off the bass and that's that. <laughs> so, yeah, that's all. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you're kind of, are you now, when you're making stuff, you're now knocking that bass off straight away or are you, you still just no, kind of leave still it? No, it, yeah, I'm still, and then, I mean, it would be better if I could learn to mix a track <laughs> that was right, because it messes up the compression of it, doesn't it? But it's more about it sounding, you know, me being excited in the studio mm. and it sounding, yeah, maybe I'll get some bigger speakers. Yeah, as long as it comes out at the end okay, and it, yeah, it always, I think you can always get too precious about the sound quality and stuff, and as long as it, as long as people can hear all the notes and your, you know, the dynamics of it and stuff, then that's all that really matters, you know, it's, yeah, listening back to, like old Italo disco or something, it breaks every rule of how to make a dance mm. record now. Mm. Therefore, all those rules are wrong because the Italo disco is more fun to dance to than all the house yes. now. <laughs>